to listen to you. That's our prayer this morning. By your Holy Spirit, may we hear you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 21. It's a rather lengthy text to read here, but it is beautiful, it's poetic, it soars, and I hope that you will uh, listen to that. And our title of our message this morning is, You Spin Me Right Round. All right. Some of you get that. All right, it's good. It's going to go through your head all day. (laughs) Hear now the word of the Lord. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zoan and their envoys have arrived in Hanaz, everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them who bring neither help nor advantage but only shame and disgrace. A prophecy concerning the animals of Negev. Through a land of hardship and distress, of lions and lionesses, of adders and darting snakes, the envoys carry their riches on donkeys' backs, their treasures on the humps of camels, to that unprofitable nation, to Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore I call her Rahab the do-nothing. Go now, write it on a tablet for them, inscribe it on a scroll, that for the days to come it may be an everlasting witness." For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions, and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, prophesy illusions, leave this way, get off this path, and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended on deceit, the sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly, that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says, In repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses, therefore you will flee. You said, we will ride on swift horses, therefore your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one, at the threat of five you will flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. Yet the Lord, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, therefore he will rise up to show you compassion, for the Lord is a God of justice, blessed are all who wait for him. People of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 2013, in an article that appeared in the Iceland Review entitled, Lost Woman Looks for Herself in Iceland's Highlands. That story also made national news here in the U.S. Lost Woman Looks for Herself in Iceland's Highlands. And the story centered around a woman, a tourist to Iceland, who was on a tour bus going to visit some of the volcanic uh, canyons in Iceland. 
And so she was on this tour bus and a whole bunch of other people. They all got off the bus. They went and did their thing and then their tour. And then they all came back and got on the bus except for one woman. The people remembered and witnessed her getting off the bus, but they don't recall her getting back on the bus, and they waited for her. The bus driver waited. They waited for her to come back. She didn't come back, and eventually the bus driver called the police. And the police brought in and formed a search and rescue team. A rescue helicopter was sent. They searched for 12 hours until it was finally called off, and it was called off because they had discovered that the woman was not really missing. She was actually on the bus. She was actually even part of the search party. She went looking for herself. You see, what had happened was when the woman got off the bus to go to the tour, she decided to freshen up at the little uh, station there, right? She went in there, and she freshened up, and she even changed her clothes at that time, and <laughs> must have been quite a transition, because when she got back on the bus, nobody recognized her anymore. <laughs> and she didn't even recognize it when she heard the description of the lost person. She didn't recognize it, you know, as herself. And when she realized, finally, that she was the one who was missing, she apologized to the police and told them she had no idea that she was the one who was lost. Now, the woman, of course, was not actually lost, right? But that story got me thinking about how sometimes we get lost in life, spiritually lost, and how we often don't realize that we are lost, that we're the ones who are lost. It's so easy to go astray, isn't it? It's very easy to get lost. Sometimes we actually want to get lost. Have you ever wanted to get lost? Sometimes life is hard and we just want to run away from it, go in the other direction. As the boss put it in a hungry heart, got a wife and kids in Baltimore, Jack. I went out for a ride and I never went back. Like a river that don't know where it's flowing, I took a wrong turn and I just kept going. It's easy to get lost, particularly spiritually lost. As the hymn writer put it, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. It's easy to get lost. It's hard to find your way back. This morning in our time together, I want to contemplate that. I want to contemplate how we become spiritually lost and how we find our way back. So our theme this morning is the theme of repentance, and you might find that to be an odd theme for the season of Advent. Isn't that for Lent? Isn't that for the season that is before us, ahead of us? But actually, in the history of the church, in the celebration of Advent, repentance is one of the core themes of it. In fact, in many traditions, Advent is referred to as Little Lent. But this is a time to think about our sin, about turning away, about turning to God. Because we all know we have all gone astray. We all know it's a weary world that will rejoice. That we are fast bound in sin and nature's night. When Jesus shows up in his first advent, what is the prelude? Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. Advent and repentance are wrapped together. It's a time for repentance, a time to consider how we become lost and how we find our way back to God. So let's do that this morning. Let's think about it together. Let's begin by considering how it is that we get lost. How do we go in the wrong direction? And in our text, the prophet Isaiah tells us there's two steps to this process. There's two steps to getting lost. So here's how we become lost, according to the prophet Isaiah. 
Step number one is this. Step number one, we choose to go our own way rather than God's way. We choose to go our own way rather than God's way. And that's exactly what happened here in Isaiah 30. When we enter this text, Israel is in a tough situation. They are fearful. They are hard-pressed. They're facing one of those challenges in life. They're confronted with oppression from the Assyrians, and they want their freedom. They want their independence, and they want it so bad that they were willing to make an alliance with Egypt. They chose to put their hope in the Egyptians, to make an alliance with them. Now, this plan, on a certain level, was rational. They were facing an enemy, and so they decided to align themselves with an ally. It seemed on its face like a good plan, but it was not God's plan for them. And frankly, it was a bit insulting to God. If you know the narrative of the Bible, the history of Israel, you know that it is God who liberated His people from Egypt, and now His people go back and yoke themselves to Egypt to seek their liberation. And God is not happy. Isaiah 30, verses 1 and 2, we start right out with God speaking to the nation. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. Israel chose to go their own way rather than God's way. And that's how it begins. Not just for them, for us. This is how every sin begins. This is how we go in the wrong direction. This is how we become lost. Without consulting God, we go our way, rather than His way. We take a wrong turn, and we just keep going in a direction that's opposite of God. That's what Israel did. It's what we do. We do it all the time. Like them, we place our trust in the wrong people. We place our trust in the wrong places. We so often choose the wrong solutions to our problems. We make foolish alliances. We enter into Faustian bargains. And Israel did that here. They made a foolish alliance. And God tells them it'll be foolish. He points it out to them. You see, they think their strength will be in Egypt. But God tells them and reveals to them here that Egypt is a Potemkin village. It's a facade. It only looks strong. It really isn't strong. God says to them in verse 7, it will be utterly useless, this alliance. And he refers to Egypt as Rahab the do-nothing. Now, what is that about? He's not referring to the Rahab of Joshua's time who was far from being a do-nothing. Rather, Rahab is part of the image for the chaos monster, the Leviathan, the dragon, the powerful beast, the monster. And what God is saying is you think this is the Rahab, this is the Leviathan, this is the dragon that will rise up, but it is a toothless dragon. It is a lazy behemoth. It will do nothing. A paper tiger. But Israel couldn't see it. They couldn't see the truth even when it was before them. They had no idea that they were lost. They couldn't see it. Israel thought they had made the right choice. That they were on the right path. But they had made the wrong choice, and they couldn't see it. They didn't know that they were the ones who were lost. It's hard to see it when you're on the wrong path. We have what's called a biased blind spot. 
a bias blind spot. We can often see the foolish decisions of other people, but it's really hard to see your own foolish decisions, isn't it? We're always an expert on everybody else's life. We can see it clearly in others. We can't see it in ourselves. That's the bias blind spot. Jonah Lehrer in The New Yorker wrote about this. He was writing an article about a study on the cognitive bias blind spot, how we can't see the wrong choices in ourselves, but only in others. And he describes the dynamics in that article in The New Yorker. He writes, When considering the irrational choices of a stranger, for instance, we are forced to rely on how they behave. We see their biases from the outside, which allows us to glimpse their errors. However, when assessing our own bad choices, we tend to engage in elaborate introspection. We study our motivation and search for relevant reasons. We convince ourselves we're right. In his book, uh, Craig Gross, his book, Open, he uses an illustration. It's one I've done myself, right? You, You take when you're driving, and you see some idiot driving like a maniac, right? What do you say about that person? Well, that person's an idiot. You might say some other colorful things about that, right? But you immediately notice it, and you think there's no good reason for this. This is terrible. There's no reason to risk the lives of other people. Why are you doing that? And then you find yourself driving like crazy. And you tell yourself why you're doing it, right? You come up with the reasons. Well, I'm very important. I got to get to this meeting or I, you know, my, I got to pick up my kid and I left the office, whatever. We come up with our own excuses. We often can't see that we are headed in the wrong direction. We don't realize that we have taken a wrong turn. And the interesting thing in that study he was referring to, done by James Madison and University of Toronto researchers there, what they found was that the smarter you are, the more cognitively sophisticated you are, the bigger your blind spot. That kind of makes sense, right? Because the smarter you are, the more clever you are, the easier it is for you to come up with rationalizations, to work through this in your mind. Now, some of you are pretty smart. Other of you, not, you know, maybe not so much. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? We're really clever when it comes to explaining and excusing our own behavior, and so we can't see it, Israel couldn't see it, and that's how it all begins. That's how we get lost. We choose to go our own way rather than God's way, and I want you to think about your life this morning, right here in this moment. Have you made that choice? Have you taken that wrong turn? And just kept going. Have you sat there making this kind of alliance with something, thinking that it's going to save you, knowing it's not what God has for you? Have you hooked up with a do nothing Rahab in your mind and in your heart? Can you see that you're on the wrong path, that you've made an unwise choice, forged a poor alliance? Can you see in your biased blind spot? That's how it begins. Step one, we choose to go our way rather than God's way. Now, step two is this, according to Isaiah. Step two is we stop listening to God. We stop listening to God. You see, we take the wrong turn and we just keep going and then we plug our ears. Because here's what God always does. He warns us. When we're on the wrong path, God is gracious. He warns us. He sends us prophets. He sends us preachers. He sends us His Spirit and His Word to help us to see what we're unable to see on our own. To see in our blind spot, right? Our biased blind spot. And He did this for ancient Israel. He sent them prophets. He sent them seers. He sent them Isaiah to help them to see. But the people did not want to listen. Isaiah 9, 9 through 11, this is what the Lord says. He says, For these are rebellious people. This is what Isaiah is speaking to them. For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. 
and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Instead, they say this, tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. God sent them His Word. He sent them people to say, you're going in the wrong direction, but they did not want to hear it. They didn't want to hear that they were on the wrong path, that they had taken a wrong turn. I've shared with you before that I enjoy hiking. We went hiking yesterday together uh, with Katie and my wife and I. We went out, and uh, I have an app on my phone for hiking. It's All Trails. It's a great app. And it has like the trail programmed in. It's GPS, right? So I can find out where I'm going so I don't get lost. And one of the things it does is if I go off the trail, right, the pre-programmed path I'm supposed to take, it sends me a little warning. Ding! You know, your phone goes off. And I pull up and the little screen says, wrong turn. And then it says below, I have this option. Would you like to mute this for the rest of your journey? That's what Israel did. They were on the wrong path. They had left where God was telling them to go. They went their own way. God warned them, and what did they choose to do? They chose to mute it for the rest of the journey. Don't get in my face, God. Stop confronting me with the Holy One of Israel. And did you catch the irony in that, right? There's this great irony here in the text because What they're saying here, God sends these prophets and these preachers to them, these seers, and they're trying to help Israel get on the right path because it's on the wrong one. But this is what they say to the prophets, leave this way, get off this path. Right? The prophets were saying that to them. You need to leave this way. You need to get off this path. You need to come back to God's plan. But instead they say, no, you leave this path, preacher. You leave this path, prophet, seer. It's that great irony that is so true in our lives, right? God says, you're going in the wrong direction. And we say back to God, no, you're going in the wrong direction. He tells us to leave this path. We tell him, you leave the path. Now, you know who's going to win, right? When you have two things saying, you know, this is the right direction, this is the right direction, and one of them is God and one of them is you, you're going to lose. It makes me think of that old preacher's illustration. You may have heard this somewhere along the way. It's a little hackneyed, but I still like it. It fits perfectly here in this context. This version comes from an article by Paul Aiello in Leadership Journal. It involves a captain of a ship. And the captain, you know, is out there. It's nighttime. He looks, he sees lights on the horizon, these faint lights in the distance, and he immediately tells his signalman, uh, signalman to send a message. Send a message, right? He thinks out there, he says, Send this message, alter your course 10 degrees south. And promptly a return message was received from the lights there. Alter your course 10 degrees north. You see, they're going back and forth. The captain was angered so that his command had been ignored, so he sent a second message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am the captain. And the message came back, alter your course 10 degrees north, I am seaman 3rd class Jones. And the captain was really mad now. So he sent a third message, knowing they would fear the person on the other end, alter your course 10 degrees south, I am a battleship. And then the message came back, alter your course 10 degrees north, I am a lighthouse. That's exactly what Israel is doing, right? God's saying, alter your course. No, God, alter your course. But God's the lighthouse. But they wouldn't listen to him. They had just stopped listening. And I want to ask you this morning, have you stopped listening to God? 
Have you just turned them off? Have you done what Israel did here? Have you said, God, stop confronting me with this? I don't want to hear it. You have to be wrong because clearly I have to be right. My direction, my course is the right course. Is that reflective of who you are? Because that's how we get lost. First, we choose to go our own way rather than God's way. And then secondly, we just stop listening to God. We reject being confronted with the Holy One of Israel. That's how we get lost. So what do we do about it? How do we find our way back? How do you, how do you change direction when you're headed in the wrong direction? Well, the answer is rather simple according to Isaiah, according to God, according to the Scriptures. What do you do if you are headed in the wrong direction? You turn around. It's not rocket science. You turn around. There's only one way out. That's to go back. In an article in Leadership Journal, Brian uh, Weatherton tells this little story about this this, uh, town in a remote part of Canada, in Labrador, Canada, a town called Wabush. And it was like one of these really isolated places way off on its own in the wilderness. And they finally constructed a road to it, one road leading into Wabush. It was like a six to eight hour drive. And if you drove there, there was only one way to get back. The same way you came in. One road out. And that's true spiritually too. You have to turn around. And in Christianity, we call that repentance. That's the big word for it. And what it means really is turn around. John Oswald says to repent is to turn about mentally, spiritually, and behaviorally. John Frame in a systematic theology says repentance is actually turning away from sin just as faith is turning to Christ. Two sides of one coin. When you turn away from sin, you turn to God. There's one way out. You turn around. You go back. And God says to Israel, this is the way. Isaiah 30, verse 15, this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. The New Revised Standard Version says, in returning and rest you shall be saved. Turn around. Turn around. When you're headed in the wrong direction, you need to spin right round. You need to do a spiritual U-turn. You need to begin to walk back to God. And that's what God wanted Israel to do. He said, just turn around. And you know what they told him? You know what they said when God offered them this? Is just come back, find your rest. Just turn around. This is what they said to him. The rest of that verse, verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And then God says, but you would have none of it. You would have none of it. God offers it, but they don't want it. What about you? Do you want it? Do you want to change the direction of your life? Do you want to walk away from sin and in turn to God? Do you want to repent? Do you want to take that one road back in what is found your salvation and your rest and your hope? Or are you saying to God, talk to the hand, right? I don't want it. They would have none of it. Repentance is really a mystery. 
I spent a lot of time this week thinking about repentance, opening up systematic theologies about repentance, talking and looking at scriptures about repentance, about what it means. And really all I can come down to is that the truth of scripture is that repentance is both a gift and a command, a gift and a command. And I don't know how that works. This is one of the reasons I love God, because I can't figure Him out. I don't know. He commands us to repent, but then tells us we need Him to do it. Some turn around. I see this as a pastor. Some turn around. Some don't. Some say, I will have none of it. I don't know how it all gets sorted out. I guess it's not my job. It's His. I don't know how it all works in the mystery of God's will, but I do know this. I can proclaim this to you this morning. I know that God wants you to repent. I know He longs for you to turn to Him. And I know this. I know He's really patient. He really wants you to come home and He will wait for you. I know that because the Scripture says it. He's waiting for you to come home. He's waiting like an eager parent. Not like some grumpy person, right? Not with some to give you judgment. He wants to embrace you. On Friday this week, my, my daughter came home uh, from Calvin. And, uh, you know, I've got, uh, I try not to be a helicopter parent, but when she's driving, I got the rescue helicopter. (laughs) So I got, you know, on my iPad, I got that little thing. I can uh, find your phone thing. I can track her. So I can see where she is. And I've given my daughter a little avatar. You know, you can give your avatars on there. It's a little monkey. (laughs) Just a monkey head. Kind of a cartoon one. Looks like Curious, curious George. Uh, so, when I, so when I look on the map, what I see is this little monkey head going along the road. <laughs> and on Friday, you know, I'm working and some of that. But I'm watching that every once in a while. Where is she? Watch that little monkey head move closer and closer. Michigan, you know, up there, Port Huron, into Canada. The great nation of Canada. Going through Ontario, coming down. Then you can kind of, you know, I I can kind of time this out. I wanted to be home when she got home. And you can kind of see that, though. Now she's on 390, coming up. Scurry home because I want to be there. You can see her going down Scribner. You know, you can see her going, getting closer. And then, you know, it's the car pulling around the corner pulling up into the driveway, and I run out the door of the house. And on my tippy toes, I kind of get that first hug when you see, right? She's home. She's home. I waited all day for her to be home. That's the portrait that Isaiah gives us of God waiting for his people to come home. Isaiah 30, verse 18, yet the Lord longs, yet the Lord longs, you could translate it as many translations do, yet the Lord waits, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, therefore He will rise up, not in judgment, He will rise up, not to condemn you, He will rise up to show you compassion. The Lord waits to be gracious. Barry Webb, in his commentary on this verse, writes this, Now comes the turning point of the chapter, and with it the profound irony which lies at the heart of its message. The Lord longs to be gracious, and His eagerness to be so is expressed by the fact that He rises to do it. He stands on tiptoe, so to speak, ready to extend His mercy to the rebels, since they will not wait for Him, He must wait for them. And then he concludes, the picture is like that of a loving father in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. He is the God who waits. Praise be to God. He's the God who waits. And he's really patient. 
so much more than I am for sure. He's really patient. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's the Lord who waits, and in our Advent hope, and really our Advent hope, it's not found in our waiting for God. Our Advent hope is found in the graciousness of the Lord who waits for us. He is the Lord who waits. 